On March 24, 2011, a teenaged boy, Raymond Byes, was taken to the hospital after falling unconscious. He was two months into his three-month stay at Echo Wild Game Rangers camp. Ray's mom had hoped that the tough love and labor at the camp would see her son coming out as a better person on the other side. Instead, Ray was abused, tortured, and starved to death. This is Monsters. Raymond Byes was born on June 2, 1995, in Boxburg, East Rand, a 30-minute drive from the city of Gold, Johannesburg, South Africa. Raymond, or Ray as his mother called him, grew up without a father. Things were challenging, but Wilna tried to make things work. She didn't have a relationship with her own father growing up and had lived through her mother's multiple marriages. Until Ray was nine years old, it had just been him and his mother. Then, Wilma met car salesman Guy's Nazar. Ray wasn't entirely impressed with his mother's new boyfriend, but he eventually got used to him. Wilma and Guy's welcomed a son, to whom Ray was a great big brother. Guy's tried to build his relationship with Ray by buying him new sports equipment for school, whether a new cricket bat or a pair of rugby boots. They were items that Wilma was never able to afford herself. Ray was never very passionate about sports and would slowly lose interest in those shiny new things. He struggled in school, often running away during class or not arriving in the mornings. Ray had some learning difficulties and was bullied in school, so it isn't hard to see why he was reluctant to attend. He was put on Ritalin at one stage, a medication used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but Ray refused to take the tablets. He bounced around three different schools and found it hard to make friends each time. In one incident, a fellow student held a knife to Ray which led him to soiling his pants. This likely escalated the bullying. Wilna ended up taking Ray out of school before they expelled him. Once he was home, Wilna and guys battled to keep Ray under control. He started smoking and swore all the time. Ray wasn't respectful towards either Wilna or guys and was always on his phone. They were at their wit's end on how to best deal with Ray going forward, and then guys heard about a place called Echo Wild Game Rangers Camp. A friend stated that his cousin's son had attended the camp and had come out better for it. It wasn't cheap, but a cost of 22,000 South African Rand for the three-month course. That was close to 1,200 American dollars or 1,100 euros. Wilna and guys took out a loan to pay for it, thinking that it would teach Ray some discipline and lead to him getting a job as a game ranger once he was finished. The camp claimed to instill faith, discipline, rules and regulations, respect, hard work, hard education, tough physical exercise, bearing, literacy, numeracy, efficiency, reliability, teamwork, animal care, and conservation and community defense. Before sending Ray off to the camp, Guys and Wilna visited the facility. It was an hour's drive from Johannesburg. Once there, they met Alex de Coker, who liked to be called the General. De Coker was born in 1964 and completed two years of compulsory national service for the South African Defense Force, as had Guys. He had never received the rank of General, though. Guy's first-hand experience in the army meant he knew this type of work would be challenging, but he felt it was instrumental in making him the man he was today. He hoped it would do the same for Ray. When Wilna and Guy's went into the general study, they saw countless photos of him on the walls. He claimed to have trained over 300 South African boys who all went on to get jobs either as game rangers or farm guards. Wilna recalled that Ray was excited about the idea of the camp. He had always been a real animal lover, and being a game ranger would be his ideal job. On January 12, 2011, Wilna and guys dropped Ray off at Echo Wild Game Rangers Camp. The next time Wilna saw her son in person, he was unrecognizable. The camp sat on five acres of land with one single-story family home in the middle of the plot. 
The general lived there with his wife and several children. His oldest son, Anthony, occasionally helped with tasks around the camp. Overall, there were six boys on the course at one time. Their stay was harsh from the word go. They lacked basic amenities like running water, toilets, or electricity. Ray had been dropped off with his cell phone, but when Wilna tried to call him the next day, she got no answer. She called him repeatedly the next week before guys drove to the camp to see what was happening. When he arrived, there wasn't a person in sight. Guys assumed that the boys were out on some exercise with the general. What neither of them knew at the time was that Ray had escaped after his first week. Unfortunately, he was found by one of DeCoker's neighbors and taken back to the camp. Wilna and guys also didn't know that two boys had already previously died under the general's care at a different camp. 25-year-old Eric Kalitz was hit, burned, and wounded. DeCoker reportedly told Eric that he wasn't a mafi, a homophobic slur meaning gay, and said he would, quote, make a man out of him. Eric went to the camp hoping he would come out of it with a job as a game ranger with the possibility of earning 5,000 rand per month. His sister described Eric as a miracle baby. He was born very premature, even dying in the incubator before being successfully resuscitated. Eric was left slightly brain damaged due to that and wasn't able to finish school. Eric was at the camp for just a week before he died. He had been training alongside 14 other men in South Africa's northwest province. His family was informed of his passing via a text message saying he had suffered a heart attack. The cause of death later changed to a seizure and then another time to dehydration. It was eventually revealed that Eric had died from a brain bleed. The other boy that died under Alex de Coker's care was 19-year-old Nicholas Vanderwalt. According to Eric's sister, Nicholas was beaten before having a seatbelt tied around his neck. He was then dragged back to camp. Police spokesperson Director Sally De Beer stated, quote, the paramilitary-style training presented on this course was not normal ranger training. Information had come in from specific sources that the camp was actually a right-wing training camp where Alex de Coker was training the young men to be soldiers. He had been advertising his training camp since mid-2006, where it operated out of a town on the Clip River. Thirteen people supposedly helped run the camp, including Bianca Pronk and Jacques Mans, who were both arrested alongside de Coker. Detectives from the Violent Organized Crimes Unit apprehended de Coker and Pronk in East London. Mans was arrested on a farm in the Eastern Cape. All three suspects were released on bail. De Coker was told he couldn't leave Gauteng province or apply for a passport. Director De Beer wouldn't provide further comment about the boys' deaths, but she did say, quote, Every aspect of the deaths will be thoroughly investigated. Alex De Coker was convicted of Eric's death, but was only given a suspended sentence. He was not found guilty of Nicholas's death, possibly due to insufficient evidence. For some bizarre reason, De Coker was not banned from working with children. Some sources have stated that his camps were actually conversion camps. Sources said, quote, We don't know whether Ray or any other boys who attended the camps were gay. We do know that de Coker used homophobic slurs against the boys and stated he would make them into men. Warrant Officer Cornell Fitzel later built the prosecution's case against the general. He believed Ray was the weakest boy in the group, which led him to become the target of de Coker. He said, quote, he was shy and vulnerable. The other boys picked on him and de Coker encouraged them and joined in. He was arrogant, a psychopath, but not stupid. He could be charming. De Coker's right-hand man was Michael Casper Erasmus. Erasmus was born in 1993 and, like Ray, was a troubled child. He ran away from home often and dropped out of school at 13. In 2010, his parents enrolled him at Echo Camp. Erasmus was 17 years old at the time. He struggled with de Coker's treatment of him and ran away on several occasions, making his way back home. Sadly, each time he was returned. After his final escape, Erasmus knew he couldn't go home. He tried to live on the land for four weeks, but eventually relented and returned to the camp. At least there he would have food and shelter. Erasmus later claimed he only followed de Coker's orders as he had nowhere else to go.
About a month after Wilna saw her son, on February 14th, de Coker arrived at her home. He hadn't warned her about his visit, but he came bearing news about Ray. De Coker claimed that Ray had been causing trouble and was refusing to eat. This concerned Wilna, and she asked de Coker whether she should take him out of the course. He reassured her that he would win Ray over and told her not to worry too much. Two weeks followed, with no communication until she received an email. It had a picture attached of Ray in a wetsuit. The first thing Wilna noticed was his size. Ray had lost significant weight since she dropped him off. In her mind, though, Wilna attributed this to the intensive training he must have been going through. Guys thought the same. He said, quote, Training is hard. You lose weight and put on muscle. It's not supposed to be easy. Wilna wanted to speak to Ray and make sure he was okay. This proved exceedingly difficult. She got to the point where she threatened to call the police, and only then did she get her phone call. Wilna spoke to Ray on March 12th, but he wasn't alone. It was a conference call, and de Coker was there the entire time. He told Wilna that Ray was hurting himself. When Ray replied, quote, Mom, I'm not, de Coker promptly hung up the phone. That was the last time Wilna ever spoke with Ray. Later during the trial, testimony was heard about Ray's treatment at the camp from the other boys who were there. It was truly horrific. Erasmus was often the main instigator. He routinely beat Ray when he didn't perform his expected duties. Some of the boys stated Erasmus even made Ray eat his own feces and soap powder. Ray tried to hang himself shortly before de Coker arrived at Wilna's home in February. It was all too much and he wanted the abuse to end. He was unsuccessful, and Erasmus then ensured Ray was chained to his bed every night. The abuse reached its peak on March 24th. Erasmus made Ray remove his clothes and plunged him into a water barrel. Medical examiners believed the sharp edges of the barrel are what broke Ray's ribs. Erasmus then placed a pillowcase over Ray's head. De Coker stepped in and kicked and tasered Ray repeatedly. Ray eventually fell unconscious. As if that wasn't enough, he was then chained to the flagpole. When Erasmus tried to wake Ray up, he found he was unresponsive. He and de Coker then drove him to the nearby medic clinic in Verenaging. Despite the severity of the situation, de Coker told Wilna over the phone that her son had been admitted for simple tests. Wilna dropped everything and drove to see Ray. Initially, she was blocked by hospital staff from entering the room as de Coker told them that she had abused him. Social workers at the hospital were appalled by Ray's condition. They phoned the police and told them the name of the camp that he had come from. It was raided, but de Coker was gone. He attempted to hide out for a week before turning himself in. The doctors at the medic clinic were floored by Ray's injuries. He was skin and bone, had multiple cigarette burns, and was in a coma. Ray had suffered severe brain damage and showed signs of kidney failure. He also had broken ribs. The doctors believed some of the 61 injuries found were inflicted up to a month prior. Ray never awoke from the coma and was pronounced dead on April 20th. Alex de Coker and Michael Erasmus were both brought to trial for the murder of Raymond Byes. South Africa does not have a jury system, so it was up to the magistrate to decide the fate of the men before her. De Coker tried his best to delay the trial. He changed lawyers multiple times and even tried to get married while in custody. He maintained his innocence throughout the proceedings. He denied ever laying a finger on Ray or telling Erasmus to do so. De Coker blamed Ray for his own condition, saying he refused to eat, burnt himself with boiling water, and cut himself with wire he found laying around. De Coker later said, quote, He sat the whole day and did nothing. He was full of tricks. While he awaited trial, De Coker put out a statement on a far-right forum he was a frequent participant of. He said that Ray was, quote, cast away due to his rebellious nature by his mother and her boyfriend. They dropped him off at the gate. They were willing to pay thousands of rand just to be rid of him. The young man's behavioral deviations were noticed immediately. Speaking of Erasmus, referring to him as accused too, the magistrate said, quote, The testimony of accused too that he followed instructions because he didn't have any other option is rejected by the court. 
Accused 2 didn't just follow instructions from Accused 1 to abuse Bies, but also did it out of his own initiative. On April 16, 2015, 49-year-old Alex DeCoker was sentenced to 20 years behind bars for murder, with an additional 5 years for child abuse. 22-year-old Michael Erasmus was given 3 years under correctional supervision with a 12-year suspended sentence. The court believed that Erasmus had a good chance of rehabilitation following his abuse under DeCoker. Not only did Alex DeCoker abuse and murder young men, he did it while claiming he could better their lives, making him not only a monster, but a fraud. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.